Well, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to those of you in various parts of the world. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Truly Automated Light and Color Measurement for Telltales and Indicators. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the new methods and techniques for capturing high accuracy measurements in illuminated symbols, which is, of course, extremely relevant in um, industries such as automotive and aerospace and beyond. My name is Shana Warner. I am the Creative Marketing Specialist here at Radiant Vision Systems. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Shannon Roberts. Shannon is a product manager here at Radiant. She's held several positions within the company over the past few years, including several in applications engineering and now product management. She has extensive hands-on experience helping our customers to solve these types of challenges. Uh, now in her product management role, she's also been instrumental in the development of some of the new software features that she's going to demonstrate for you today. Uh, before I pass things over to Shannon, just a couple of housekeeping items. I wanted to mention that we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time during the broadcast, however, and to do so, just type your question into the panel that's generally going to appear over on the right-hand side of your screen, and then just press submit to get that question over to us. As I mentioned, we will be queuing questions to answer after the presentation. When the presentation is over, Shannon will go ahead and answer those questions live. Um, and then I guess we're ready to get started. So with that, I will go ahead and hand things over to Shannon. All right, Shannon, take it away. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Today on the agenda, we're going to be starting off with an introduction about Radiant Vision Systems. Next, I'm going to be talking about the importance of measuring telltales and indicators and some of the trouble with current methods. Next, I'm going to introduce our solution, Auto POI, which will be the focus of today's webinar. I'm then going to go through a practical step-by-step -step guide for how someone would go about setting up an automatic point of interest set and taking measurements. Next, I'm going to address some of the challenges in doing these types of measurements in manufacturing and how Radian addresses those. I'm going to finish up with a short software demonstration, and then we're going to end with questions. Radiant Vision Systems designs, manufactures, and sells camera-based solutions that are used for sophisticated light and measurement solutions in both R&D and production. We're headquartered in Redmond, Washington, as well as offices in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Seoul. In August of 2015, we were acquired by Konica Minolta and are now part of the Konica Minolta family. We have thousands of imaging colorimeters and photometers that are testing millions of displays and other illuminated components in production settings, as well as R&D settings throughout the world. Today we're going to be talking about truly automated light and color measurement systems using an imaging colorimeter. On the right, we have an image showing the imaging colorimeter. So automated visual inspection, or AVI systems, are used to measure visual quality of devices quickly and accuracy. So we're using an imaging colorimeter, which has tristimulus matched filters that are sophisticated and calibrated to match human perception. So the idea here is that we're using an imaging colorimeter test and measurement device to do quality control uh, to match human perception. Uh, this presentation is going to outline new developments in the software that goes with the imaging colorimeter. And these developments assist instrument cluster manufacturers in the successful integration of AVI for their test and measurement applications. Uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, the importance of measuring telltales and indicators, as well as some of the requirements and challenges that come along with this. So to start off, I want everyone to take a look at the image of an instrument cluster. So this is a typical display that would want to be measured for quality control. In this image, there's a few different things that you might notice. So the first one here is that this 100 indicator appears dimmer than its neighbors. So these are the type of flaws that you want to catch in your manufacturing process. Additionally, if we come down here to this indicator, you might notice that it looks a little bit pinker than its neighbors. So the types of measurements that we're going to be talking about involve using an imaging colorimeter to basically take um, a measurement um, or a picture with a scientific grade CCD and then use all of that information 
to, to tell us about the, the luminance or brightness of a character as well as its color. And then we can use that information as well as uh, pass-fail criteria to inspect um, an entire instrument cluster all at once. So the method that we're going to use to do this testing is called points of interest. So the idea of a point of interest is that it's, it's a region in the measurement taken by the imaging colorimeter that we then average over to provide the average luminance and color. Uh, so on this slide, we have an example of a display. So this is a little bit different than indicators, but it's kind of a good way to introduce the concept. So when we have a display such as like a TV or computer monitor or even a display in an automobile, the display is typically rectangular. Therefore, we can register the edges of the display and then uh, put on our points of interest. So for example, we have the Nan uh, ANSI 9 point standard. So this is a standard that defines where these points of interest are located relative to the screen as well as the pass-fail values. So when we have something like a display, points of interest are pretty straightforward. All of the area is illuminated and the shape is consistent. Automotive displays, on the other hand, have unique arrangements of indicators and telltales, and therefore we need a more adaptable method. So when we're calculating the average luminance of a character, kind of a typical way to do this is to use a point of interest that's larger than the character. So here we've drawn a rectangle, which is outlined in yellow. So this rectangle tells us the region that we want to be looking for our data. So if we just take the average over this rectangle, we're going to be getting a luminance value that is too low. This is because within the point of interest, we're averaging over all of the pixels. And here you can see that a lot of the pixels are actually the black background that we don't want to include. So the way that we can get around this is to use a luminance threshold. So here we need to be smart. So if we apply, um, let's say, so before when we have no luminance threshold in the image, we can see that the value it gets us is around 27 candelas per meter squared, which is too low because the false color scale goes all the way up to about 200 candelas per meter squared. Once we uh, applied our luminance threshold, uh, we're getting an average luminance of around 115, which is, which is much more reasonable. So using these uh, points of interest that are larger than the area and then applying the threshold as kind of the a standard method for measuring these characters and then reporting out the luminance and color values. Uh, there are some challenges, however, with this method. So um, we're going to be using this image here that shows some typical indicators that would be found in an automobile. So if you wanted to measure all of these indicators at once, you would use an imaging colorimeter to capture an image like I have on the right. So you can see in one measurement, we're able to get all of the data, and now we need to process the data to get the relevant information. So one way we can do this is to manually draw these rectangular points of interest around each symbol. The problem here, though, is it's very time consuming, especially if you have very complex or multi-symbol displays where the symbols also may vary in position and size. So if we think that back to that uh, image of uh, a dash that I showed earlier, just think of how many little rectangles you would need to go in and draw, and also, you know, some of those indicators weren't, um, you know, equally spaced. So it'd be, it'd be hard to, to draw those, you can imagine. Uh, and throughout this presentation, you're going to see kind of these green rectangles. Um, and kind of this green outline is, is indicating where the point of interest is. So there's kind of some blow-ups to help make it a little bit easier to see on your screen. So instead of using uh, the method that I, I had on the previous slide where we had to draw you know, 16 rectangles, for example, for this image, we can use a new software feature that's available in Radiance Prometric or TrueTest software. Uh, Prometric and TrueTest are software that is used both to um, run the imaging colorimeter, so to uh, take the measurement and acquire data, as well as do analysis. Um, so the way that we use AutoPOI, and throughout this presentation we'll be going into more detail describing how it's actually done, uh, but we start by drawing one large area across the entire display. So you can see the green rectangle has appeared. Next, the software automatically traces the POI, um, the points of interest around the symbols, as is just shown up. Um, and this allows us to get um, the precise uh, luminance and color. 
and we're just kind of showing a, a blow up here so you can see now that the symbol has been outlined in green. So this is showing us uh, just more visually where the threshold was applied and indicating which pixels are included in the point of interest. Uh, so another issue with uh, using kind of the, the standard methods, let's say, you know, you don't mind going through and drawing those, those 16 rectangles. Uh, another thing to consider is if your device moves at all. So in kind of the, the graphic that was shown uh, previously, we had, uh, you know, the original location of the indicators, and then when the part uh, was rotated by just a few degrees, we can see now that some of the indicators are not fully within the rectangle. So any, um, any pixels that are outside of these, these regions are now um, no, longer, no longer included in the data set. So this is particularly an issue uh, if, if the part's going to be moving even just, just a little bit. Um, so instead, we can use uh, auto POI. So this is where we've drawn uh, a large region to be looking for the points. And now when it rotates, you can see that the small, small green outlines rotate with the indicators. Uh, so another issue that you might come across is having an image that has many different colors. So, um, you know, it's going to make sense that for your red indicators, you're going to have a different set of luminance and color pass-fail values most likely than, say, your yellow indicators or your green indicators. Uh, so with, with previous methods, you would need to go through and draw all of your uh, regions around all of your red characters and then go through individually and set all of the red to have the same pass-fail criteria. Next, you would need to go through and draw all of the yellow POIs and then set their own pass-fail values. So again, this is just time-consuming and also if your display was to change in any way, these points of interest would either need to be redone or moved around. So it's just a lot less flexible and can't be reused for or let's say another part that has the same yellow and red symbols, but maybe just in different locations. Um, <clears throat> so instead, we can use auto POI. So here we create a single creation region that captures all of the symbols. Uh, but here we actually have kind of uh, a new feature that's, that's pretty great. So what we can actually do is rather than just applying a luminance threshold, we can also apply a, a color threshold. So here we can say this creation region is only going to find the red symbols. And then when it finds the red symbols, it's going to automatically apply the same red pass-fail criteria. So we draw one region for red, and then next we can draw just another large rectangle for yellow, and then another for green. So here we get all of our symbols, and we just had to do three really large regions. And this point of interest set can be used for for any instrument panel that has red, yellow, and green. Um, so next, I'm just going to walk through in a little bit more detail how we go about setting up an automatic point of interest set. So to set up an, an automatic POI set, the first thing we want to do is take a measurement of a representative device. This just gives us something to, to work with and draw our points of interest on. Uh, step two is to define our creation regions. Uh, and in the next slides, we're going to go through each of these in detail. Uh, the next step is to set the creation thresholding criteria. And I'm going to talk about a few different ways to do this, including global, local, and color thresholding. The next step is to apply any pass-fail values or output values that you may want for your project. Step four is to measure the luminance and color. So now we've done all of the setup and you're ready to just use your uh, imaging color emitter to acquire data and you're good to go. And then step five is to report out results as you see fit. Uh, so the first step here is to take, take a measurement. So this can be done with either um, an imaging color emitter or photometer. And uh, the imaging color emitter captures a wide area and this enables measurement across multiple illuminated characters at once. So we have um, a, a wide range of uh, lenses, we, we have uh, various fields of view to capture large and small areas in one image. So the next thing, once you have your, um, your image, is to define a creation region. So a creation region can be a rectangle, circle, oval, or even a polygon. And this can be defined in a few different ways. So it can be defined in physical coordinates. 
Uh, so like meters or centimeters, it can be defined in pixels, or it could also be defined relative. So you could set up a creation region that was um, you know, always the same size relative to the field of view, no matter if the, the size or, or shape. Um, so uh, these creation regions will then automatically create points of interest and assign those pass-fail values. Um, step two is to set the creation thresholding criteria. The first type of thresholding that I'm going to be talking about is luminance thresholding. Um, so the way that you would do this is first the user is going to input a threshold value. So in the example that we're going to talk about first, we applied a global threshold of 30%. So what this means is the algorithm searches through the entire image and finds the brightest point. And then anything that is below 30% of that maximum is set to zero um, and is not included. Uh, you can also, instead of percent, you can set an absolute value. So if everything under five nits, for example, you didn't want to include, you could do it that way instead. So after you put in your initial threshold value, the algorithm searches through the entire creation region, looking for you know, the, anything below 30% of that maximum. And it finds all of the pixels that are above that minimum threshold. Next, it goes through and finds groups of contiguous pixels that are above, let's say, um, a minimum blob size of 10 pixels. So this way, if you, um, you can basically say you know, your, your point of interest region has to be a certain minimum size. And next, it turns those grouped pixels into points of interest. So in the image below, we can see that, um, and the image below is a speedometer that's kind of blown up. We're looking at the top. So the 50 and 60 are miles per hour. And then at the bottom of the screen, the 80 and 100, those are kilometers an hour. And those are going to be a little bit dimmer. So in this example, and here I've used green to kind of shade in the point of interest just to make it a little easier to see where we're drawing it rather than the green outline. So in this case, with a global threshold of 30%, we were only able to find the brighter characters. Um, so our threshold is, is too high. Our POIs are not successful. So instead, let's uh, uh, try a threshold of 5%. So when we apply a threshold of 5%, we are successful at capturing these dimmer characters, but we have a little bit of a problem. So what we see here is that on top of the, the tick marks above the 50 and 60, we're starting to get some of the, the area that's the reflection off of the bezel. So the problem here is that the luminance of the 80 and the 100 is you know, similar to the, the luminance that's reflecting here that we don't want to include. So we need to be a little bit smarter. So we're going to use something called local thresholding. So this follows a similar process. So the user inputs an initial threshold, either a percentage or absolute value. The algorithm goes through and finds the contiguous pixels in the software. Then within each of those kind of blobs of pixels, adapts locally to variation. So there it goes and then applies a second threshold just relative to that local group of pixels. And the result is that we can accurately capture uh, both low and high luminance characters in the same image. This allows us to draw just one creation image over the entire uh, indicator panel and get all of the characters accurately. So this is just one example of how, how thresholds can be used. There's, there's a lot of flexibility to make it meet uh, you know, your specific uh, application. So that was an example of luminance thresholding. And next I want to talk about um, something really cool called color thresholding. So here the user can specify a minimum and a maximum CIE, either CXCY or U prime, B prime, that the pixel must be between. So this is a secondary set of criteria. So only pixels that meet both the luminance and color criteria are included in the point of interest set. So I want to just kind of give an example of where this might be necessary. So when we have the, uh, our speedometer again, we can see in the top image that we have a red needle intersecting a white zero. So if we did a luminance-only threshold, it's going to connect the zero and red needle together because it doesn't see them as separate components, where they, they obviously are. So in order to create a POI for just that needle, we need to use creation regions. So we basically set a boundary that's pretty large that encompasses red, and we tell the algorithm, OK, only choose the pixels that are red and above this certain luminance. So this is very useful when you have two icons, perhaps, that are touching. Uh, it's also very useful, as we showed a little bit earlier, when you're just trying to create a very large creation region, 
and then choose all of the red symbols together and set their pass fail the same and then all of the yellow symbols. So the color thresholding is a tool that can make it a lot faster to set everything up. So now that we've set the criteria to creating the points of interest, we now move on to setting the pass fail. So on this slide, we have a screenshot from the user interface of the software. So on, on the right, we can see we have many different options for pass-fail values. So for example, at the top, we have luminance, and we can put in a minimum and a maximum. Uh, we can also do color, CXCY, U prime, V prime, CCT. Uh, we can also do things such as standard deviation in the region while setting the detector size, um, and a lot of you know, min-max over region. There's just a lot of flexibility as well as dominant wavelength and purity. So in the software, you would just go in, check the ones that you want, and then you can either put in a minimum and maximum, or if you just leave it checked, it will just report out the CXCY. Uh, on the bottom here, we just have a little example of what an output might look like. So we have a, um, you know, four symbols here, and for each of them, we're reporting out the luminance, color, max, max and min values in the region, and the dominant wavelength. And based on the pass-fill values of this set, we can see two of the symbols are failing and two of them are passing. <clears throat> so we also have a new type of pass-fill value that I'd like to introduce. So for a lot of quantities such as luminance, it makes a lot of sense to have a minimum and a maximum luminance value because that's just a linear quantity. When we look at something like color, on the other hand, it's defined in a 2D color space. So if we're only able to define a maximum and minimum value, we're forced to basically constrain it to a rectangle. Um, but this, however, is not really in touch with the reality of how everyone defines their color criteria. So tier one and tier two suppliers might, um, you know, from their OEM have like an, an ellipse that the color needs to be within. So with, um, with this software, you can set that, that region to be anything that you want, um, an ellipse, rectangle, or polygon. Uh, a good example of this are McAdams ellipses. Uh, so on the right, we have an image showing uh, kind of the standard McAdams ellipses that are enlarged by a factor of 10, so we can see them. So one McAdams ellipse defines the area that, um, or kind of the, the distance from a certain point a color coordinate can be before a human notices a difference. So because, of course, we're all, you know, concerned about how a human is going to perceive color, we really want to you know, set our, our pass-fail criteria on when is a human going to notice. So if we look at the McAdams ellipses, you'll also notice that they're not all equal across the color space. Down in blue, for example, um, you know, if you change your color coordinate just a little bit, it's going to become immediately noticeable, whereas green, we have, we have a larger area that, that the color coordinate can change before a human notices. And again, this is blown up to a factor of 10 to show. So once you've defined a color region, you can then set it in that, that pass-fail criteria that I showed a little bit earlier. So now you're done with all of the setup. So at this point, you've gone through and set your creation region, you've set your thresholding criteria, and you've set your pass-fail criteria. So now you're ready to take measurements. Uh, so what I want to demonstrate here is that you can run the same inspection criteria against new devices and indicator sets without needing to go back into the software. Uh, these saved parameters or auto POI set are applied to the appropriate areas, colors, or symbols of the new display. Um, so we have set one here, and then if we measure a different set, we can see that uh, without going through and doing any uh, any changes, we're able to see this this second set of of icons with with the auto POI outlines. So this can be used to inspect different displays for luminance and color consistency during production level quality control. And lastly, we have the ability to report out results. So results are recorded in the software, uh, and these can be looked at later for offline measurements or uh, pass-fail QA. And we have some different software packages, so that there's some different abilities to output. On the right, I have a sample test output from our TrueTest software. And Radian has a lot of experience working with uh, production applications, so we can you know, work with anyone to customize the, the type of report out they need, whether a pass-fail or, or more detailed. So that's been a uh, technical description of how someone would use these new features to go about setting up an auto POI set. Now we're going to talk about how Radian addresses some of the, the challenges that come across in manufacturing and doing this tested measurement. 
so the, the first problem that comes about is the need to measure luminance of multiple points quickly, and this is impossible with a spot meter. So, you know, when a lot of this testing first began, the only equipment that was available uh, to manufacturers was a spot meter. So you have to look at one symbol at a time and take multiple measurements with a spot meter, which is what this, this graphic here is indicating. Each of those black circles kind of shows a point. Uh, and then after taking multiple points, you're able to do some statistical analysis to see how much the luminance is varying across the symbol. However, you can see that this is very time consuming because just for one symbol, you know, you're going to have multiple measurements and this is just one symbol on an entire dash. So this is not practical for manufacturing. Uh, in addition to spot meters, there are some fiber solutions. Uh, but with those, you can also just do one indicator at a time and, you know, positioning these um, the fibers is also very challenging. So instead of, you know, taking a spot meter or fiber to do single point measurements, we can take an image of the indicator and then use auto POI to get the uh, luminance and color values and get many more measurement points as we have uh, many, many pixels across, across the indicator. Um, so the next challenge is the need to measure absolute luminance and color. So there are solutions like machine vision, for example, that can, uh, you know, see if an indicator is there and if it's on. But if you want to be able to tell slight color differences or make sure that you're being consistent with luminance and color across multiple vehicles, you need to have it tied to a standard. So with an imaging color emitter, we have CIE color match tristimulus filters that allow us to measure absolute luminance and color. Therefore, you can take the color that is measured for an indicator and map it directly onto the CIE color chart. So here you have absolute data that can be consistent from line to line and uh, vehicle to vehicle. Uh, another challenge is uh, you know, fixed ring tolerances. So uh, if your fixture tolerances are not tight enough, you're not going to have perfect alignment, and that can make it challenging for, for other solutions. Uh, so what you need here is an adaptable automatic software solution that can find the characters in any location. So here with auto POI, we can see even if our uh, symbol moves a little bit to the left and rotates, we're able to still um, find, find that point of interest and still get all of the same data. Um, another challenge is that there could be many configurations of displays and instrument clusters, and those lines are going to change quickly. So you might have the same type of indicators on on a line, but they're going to be in different um, different configurations. So you don't want to have to go in and redo your setup every time your line changes. So here we can again use adaptable software with preset creation regions that can find indicators in any location. Uh, so here we can see that if our symbol changes to a battery, we're still able to, to do our, our auto POI algorithm and get the data out. Um, so lastly, another, another challenge is that um, you will need different pass-fail criteria for different color, um, either LEDs or indicators. Uh, so the solution here is to use um, color uh, creation regions along with color thresholding to create POIs and set specific pass-fail for each color LED. So what I mean by this is that we have our red indicator and our yellow indicator. So for our red indicator, for example, we have an ellipse down here that shows the acceptable boundary for coordinates. So any, any red indicator needs to be within this ellipse. And then up here we have the yellow icons and we have this, this yellow ellipse. So um, that is how we can use creation regions to set different pass-fail values automatically. So in this case, every time we draw a yellow, it's going to be associated with that um, ellipse over here, and this will be the pass-fail value. So it's really simplifying the, the setup. <clears throat> so next, I want to go through a quick software demonstration. So this software demonstration is in our TrueTest software. This software is optimized for production as it allows us to do multiple sequences of tests. Uh, in this example, I'm just showing uh, one test, which is a point of interest test. So basically where we're starting is we've already taken some images and I'm going to go in and show us how to create the point of interest set and then run it on a few different samples. Okay, so in TrueTest, we're going to open it up and go to our Define Points of Interest window. 
With indefined points of interest, I'm going to start by drawing a large rectangular creation region, which populates at the bottom. I'm going to name this red, as this is for my red icons, and open evaluation type. I'm going to make this, um, so this is the window where we set our pass-fail criteria, as well as our creation region criteria. So I'm going to choose icons red, and I'll show you in a moment where, where those settings are stored. And I want to output luminance and color. And for now, I'm not going to put any min-max. I just want to report out the values. Um, so now you can see that it drew um, the auto POI around red. So here's where I set my auto POI parameters. You can see it's called icons red. I'm using um, a threshold of 20% and then color thresholding. So I've defined a box where the, the red colors are. I'm just going to turn off my labels to make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, so I can also go through and do the same thing for yellow and green. So now that I have my points of interest, I'm ready to run my sequence. Uh, the first one I'm going to do is just our, the image that we've seen already. So it pops up. Now it applies our creation region and points of interest, and then it outputs the results. So the results are the luminance and color for each of the indicators, as well as some aggregate statistics about kind of the change in color overall. Uh, next, I'm going to be looking at the same image but rotated. So you'll note I didn't go in and do any different setup. It's using all of the same setup. And we can find these symbols as well as get our, our analysis results out. And lastly, I'm going to run our, our third serial number, which is the dashboard symbol uh, with just a different configuration. And you can see, again, it found all of the symbols quickly and reports out our analysis results. Uh, so now that I have all of my analysis, I'm going to go up to the re report generator and generate a report that I can then open in Excel. So here we have a summary on the first page, um, and then within each, uh, each tab here, I can get all of the information about all of the, the points of interest in their luminance and color values to look at later. Right. So to summarize, um, Auto POI is a software tool that measures illuminated telltales and indicators with an imaging colorimeter, and this provides increased speed and accuracy of measurement over previous methods. We employ auto-finding techniques, and this eliminates the need to ensure perfect alignment between the imaging colorimeter and the sample. Um, indicators measured for various uh, pass-fail criteria, including user-defined color regions, such as a McAdams ellipse. And this is suitable for both production and R&D applications. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Shannon. I do see that we have a few questions coming in, so we're going to take a little bit of time to answer some of your questions. If you'd like to submit one, please feel free to type in a question to the questions window on the right-hand side of your screen in the interface, and then just send that over to us and we'll answer it as it's received. Um, I see the first one here is one that I can actually answer, and that is, will we get a copy of this presentation? Uh, the answer is yes. Within the next couple days, you'll be receiving an email, and we'll provide a link to the presentation slides as well as the recording of this broadcast. Um, and I see that there are now some audience questions coming in regarding the content of the webinar, so I'm going to pass things over to Shannon to start answering those questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the first question I see is, um, is it a specific license or is it part of TrueTest or Prometric? Uh, so the answer to this is that there is no separate license for auto POI. Uh, it's a new feature that's available immediately in the latest versions of both TrueTest and Prometric. So if you are a current TrueTest or Prometric user, uh, you can reach out to our uh, support team, support at radiantvisionsystems.com, and they can provide you with the latest installer and license code. Um, so I also see there's a couple other questions. So. Um, what about inspecting instrument clusters in an LCD display? Can this be done with auto POI? So that's a great question. So uh, yes, the answer to that is yes. We can use auto POI for a variety of different applications. Uh, all you really need is to have the indicator uh, be differentiated from the surroundings, so either in luminance and color, 
We can also, if let's say you have an LCD screen that's surrounded by indicators, we can do uh, analysis for both that LCD display as well as the indicators around it. Yeah, so, um, so I see, so what is the required test environment? Dark room, is there still working in outdoor area for outdoor production verification purpose? Uh, so we do recommend that this is done in, in a dark environment to, uh, to remove ambient light, um, but I'd be happy to talk with you more about this, uh, this specific application if you have some need to do it in more, more ambient light. Okay, I see another question asking um, if our system will detect IR components, as this is generally a concern in aviation displays. Uh, and the answer is yes. So with the imaging colorimeter, uh, we can, instead of using the CIE color filters, we can use a radiometric filter, uh, and then we can measure uh, near, near IR. So the, this system can also detect, um, detect near IR. And let's see. So um, I see someone also asked about, um, can the cameras be installed above the line? So the answer here is yes. We have a lot of um, imaging colorimeters that are installed in a um, production environment. So it can be mounted uh, face down or really in, in any orientation. Yeah, and then I see here, so are you able to specify a tolerance in percent for color regions or are the tolerance sent by simply drawing on the CIE chart? Uh, so the, the answer to that is that you, you can specify um, the, the actual um, like vertices of a polygon. So you can start by drawing it, but then in the software you have a lot of control. So with an ellipse, for example, you can specify the um, center value and then provide both the min, min radius, max radius, and the um, um, and the tilt. So you can, um, even though it starts by drawing, you have absolute control to define all of the vertices of that color region. Let's see, so um, is there a limit to the number of auto um, points of interest that auto POI will find? Um, no, there, there is not a, a hard limit there. Oh yeah, and um, one from the top I see. So is it possible to judge uniformity within an indicator? Uh, and the answer to this is yes. Within the point of interest, we have such options as finding kind of the, the standard deviation within an indicator, and we can also um, report out like the min and max values. So you can definitely, um, definitely do that. Yeah, um, and then I see, see another question here that says, um, asking how often that calibra calibration might be done or must be done. Uh, so we recommend that the, the imaging colorimeter is sent back annually for a flat field calibration um, as well as, as maintenance. And then um, I also see here, so are the pass-fail values based on variations in brightness, color, or both? Uh, so it, it's definitely both. It's very customizable, so you can uh, do luminance and color or, or really any of those other um, CCT and, and things like that. Yeah, um, and so I also see, so how is the camera calibrated to human visual perception? Uh, so that's a great question. So we start off with the imaging colorimeter by having a, a scientific grade monochrome CCD. So the CCD itself is just directly measuring incoming light. Um, and then we have three, three or four tristimulus filters. Uh, so we start off with that, and then within the software um, and in our factory, we can do a um, color, uh, color calibration to get even more accurate values. So in the factory, we calibrate to um, Illuminate A, and then we also have the ability to do a um, calibration to both um, an LCD screen, so an RGBW screen, as well as any single single LEDs. Okay, so I see your question here. So our color emitter will be sent back early next year for calibration. Will auto POI be installed, updated automatically? Uh, so that's a great question as well. Uh, this feature is found in, in the software. 
So um, if you, if you want to inquire about your current support license, uh, please email support at, at radiantvisionsystems.com or info and we can get you the, the latest on that. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see, so what is the largest supported display size? Um, so there's really not any, any limit on that. We have a wide variety um, of resolution of imaging color emitters as well as lenses. So we can measure, you know, everything from having, you know, 100, you know, or microscope lenses or 100 millimeter macro as well as, um, you know, uh, really, really wide field of, field of view lenses. So we do everything from, you know, 10 meter across displays to really small displays. So it's really just a function of, um, you know, CCD sensor size the field or the um, the focal distance of, of the lens, so everywhere from like 24 millimeter up to 200 millimeter, and then your working distance. So really, with the right configuration, there's there's no no hard limit on on what we can measure. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again, Shannon, and thank you to all of you who are attending today. Uh, there's a couple questions it looks like we didn't quite get to, and we'll try to respond back to you via email. Um, I'd also like to point out that we will definitely answer any emails that you send to us over at info at radiantvs.com. We'll make sure that your question gets to the right person who can get you the answer you're looking for. Um, and then just to repeat, I saw some questions about whether we will make the recording and the slides available. Yes, we will be sending both um, the recording and presentation to you in an email. So just keep an eye out for that message and you should be able to get those both online. Uh, once again, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time.